So it's my real pleasure to be introducing uh, Steve Gaines. Steve's a long-term friend and colleague. Uh, he's served the university extremely well in many facets. He's been director of the Marine Science Institute for the last 12 years. Um, he's also a distinguished scientist. And, and although he's won a number of awards, most recently he was elected to the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science as a fellow just uh, in the last few weeks. So he's respected nationally and internationally. He um, brings a huge wealth of experience in both um, ecology and, and more recently in resource management with marine protected area studies and with uh, fisheries management issues. So I think from the point of view of the Bren School, he's, he's perfect. He has the credibility, the science, the experience. He's a great guy. And I think you'll all have a wonderful time getting to know Steve over the next few years and um, interacting with him. Today his talk is um, really a science talk. It's about um, his studies in, in marine ecosystems and uh, in relation to various issues. So with that, I want to introduce and welcome uh, Steve Gaines, the new dean of the Brent School. Thanks, John. Well, thank you everyone for coming, especially on a Friday afternoon before a nice three-day holiday weekend. It's great to see such a nice crowd and in particular such nice turnout from the community of advisory board members and dean's council members and other supporters. It's really wonderful. So I, I, I was trying to think of what I should talk about because I do a variety of different kinds of uh, scientific projects. And so in the spirit, though, of the Bren School here, I thought that the ideal thing uh, in terms of talking about some of the work that I've done would be to put this in the context of uh, my group project. And um, now, normally the students here take, what, a year of working on their project. This is, you know, I'm a little slower. It took me a while. I didn't have the training you get here in terms of how to work with economists and things like that. Uh, so uh, this is, this is going to be more like a decade-long group project. And the last uh, bits you'll see are things that we haven't even done yet, but I think we have some really interesting ideas about uh, where uh, some solutions might lie. So in the context of the group project, there are a lot of collaborators. Many of them are in this room. Many of them are at the Bren School um, who uh, have played uh, very important roles. And in fact, many of the things I'll talk about is really more their work than mine, but it fits together into this grand scheme of the issues that we're talking about. Uh, lots of disciplines, ecology, oceanography, economics, and a real um, strong focus throughout the entire project of tightly coupling the scientific work to management and policy issues. Um, so I think it fits very nicely with the thinking about the Brent School group projects. Um, so uh, the oceans have been getting a lot of bad press over the last uh, 10 years, and um, our efforts have really been trying to think about how we can reverse this trend. There, uh, the oceans, you know, when problems happen in the ocean, they go undetected often for a very long period of time because we only see the surface and a very small fraction of the ocean can we actually observe directly. And it's, it's really been with the advent of a lot of different kinds of technology and the development of uh, major new monitoring programs around the world that we've discovered over the last decade or so that there are a lot of issues that are far more complicated and problematic in terms of the state of the ocean than I think even the most ardent uh, conservation biologists who work on oceans would have suspected. And you know, I could give you dozens of examples uh, that have come out over this period of time, but just a couple. Uh, these are patterns for looking at the abundance of large predatory fish. These are tuna-type uh, pelagic fishes from a variety of different oceans around the world. You don't need to know anything about the words. All you need to see is the strikingly similar pattern of a relatively dramatic decline in abundance. Now, you would expect some decline because we are fishing them, and, and the highest productivity comes from reducing the abundance a bit. But these declines go down to on the order of 10% of historical abundance levels and suggest uh, relatively dramatic changes in the way uh, ocean ecosystems are being uh, uh, consumed by these top predators. Uh, another way to look at the uh, changes is actually to look at the yield of protein that we receive from the sea. And it peaked in the late 1980s and has been relatively constant, declining slightly since that period of time. Um, and this is a, relative, this is a really significant uh, result that was only realized 
just a few years ago because about 20% of the protein that humans consume comes from the sea. And so when you couple the trends and declines with the growth in the human population on a per capita basis, these things lead to really dramatic declines in the role of the ocean um, in terms of wild-caught seafood uh, feeding humans within a relatively short period of time. And this is a really misleading picture because the only reason why it peaked in the 1980s was uh, because, in fact, we were fishing new fisheries all the time. And you can see this. I think the most dramatic evidence of the level of impact that humans have had on the sea comes from looking at the o areas of the ocean just in the mid-60s, so when, uh, when I was uh, 10 years old, uh, that we're at areas of maximum or depleted catches. And it's a relatively small fraction of the surface of the ocean. By the time my oldest daughter was 10, the world looked really different. So the in the mid-90s, uh, essentially the entire ocean was part of global fishery and at either maximum or depleted capacity. Just a few little uh, exceptions in terms of areas. That's a really dramatic change. And as a consequence, a lot of that increase to the 1980s was being driven by the fact that we were going to new parts of the sea, going to deeper waters, uh, exploiting different species of fish. And so the declines that were happening on individual basis in many cases were not being reflected in global catch. And there's really no place left to go. So we have to fix the problem um, if we're going to uh, be able to uh, rely on food coming sustainably from the sea. Now, there have been really two classes of responses to this evidence of dramatic changes in the ocean. And they fall into um, uh, two very simple kind of areas. One is create marine protected areas. And another, and this is global calls from a lot of different areas in terms of uh, uh, dealing with the problem by essentially taking certain areas out of the impact of human uh, fishing. Another is to fix the kinds of management problems that are leading to these kinds of declines. So two kinds of global responses. We've actually been working in both of these arenas, and I want to give you an overview of what's happened uh, in the last 10 years, very rapid advancement in science in both areas, and uh, some of the role that we have played, and then uh, ultimately end by coming back and trying to pull these two things together, which is where I think the real interesting opportunities lie. Now, for, eco for an ecologist, uh, these kinds of problems create some real challenges. Um, one is that you know, we're talking about issues of very large scale. These are international, global problems. Um, and most of us learn and study systems at very local scales. So we end up having to think about how we can apply knowledge we learn at one place to dealing with a problem that's really operating on thousands of of uh, kilometers of, of ocean. A second is that ecologists are often great about identifying problems. We're not usually that great about identifying solutions. And, and then the third one is that uh, ecologists are great at studying the behavior of animals in the sea, but we're not very good about thinking about, usually, the behavior of the humans that are interacting and part of these ecosystems. And so a big part of this project and the fact that it brings in a diverse set of people with uh, different backgrounds, Chris Costello in particular on the economic side, to really be thinking about motivations for human behaviors and a variety of students looking at interesting ways we can deal with solutions to these problems, is to really break down these problems that are kind of characteristic of lots of ecology in the way we understand how these ecosystems work. So let's start with marine reserves. Um, most of the uh, call for marine reserves was really as a means of insurance. It's basically saying, uh, we don't trust that you're going to fix the problem, so we're going to take certain, we want to take certain areas of the ocean out of the hands or the impact of fisheries and uh, uh, rely on, upon that kind of spatial pattern of protection to uh, solve some of the problem. Now, in the sea, protected areas are still relatively rare. Uh, this, this map is, is a little bit old, seven or eight years old. But essentially, if you take all of the protected areas of the ocean that have some form of permanent spatial protection and squish them all together in one place, it adds up to that area that's yellow. Uh, 
And if you take all of the areas of ocean where all forms of fishing are excluded, we often call these uh, marine reserves as a form of, of a, a special form of higher level of protection in the protected area. In the year 2000, it added up to that area, that red dot. So it's a minute fraction compared to uh, the fraction of areas on land that would be in comparable levels of protect protection. It's probably two orders of magnitude smaller fraction and far less than 1% of the ocean in, in marine reserves. So it's minute. But uh, that, that red dot uh, is actually made up of marine reserves that are dispersed all over the world. So there are over the, the last 30 or 40 years, there have been dozens of complete human exclusion zones from the standpoint of fishing that have been set up in different parts of the planet. And so we've actually, we actually have the potential for learning a lot from what happens when you take people out of the picture and people in the sense of uh, fishing. And so there at the, in the last uh, synthesis we did a couple of years ago, there were 125 different marine reserves around the world where there were peer-reviewed scientific studies. And if you look at collectively what the response is in terms of these exclusions, it's relatively dramatic. Um, that here are four different measures of change that happen either before and after or comparing inside the reserve to areas outside that have remained unprotected. Looking at uh, the total mass, the biomass of fish that are there, the number of fish per unit area, their average size, and the diversity of species, all of these on average go up in many cases quite dramatically so. The biomass in particular goes up nearly 500% is the average response. Now there's huge variability as you can see. A few cases it doesn't go up at all, but 95% or so it goes up. In some cases, thousands of percent increase associated with uh, extreme overfishing in these areas outside. And so more animals, more biomass, larger animals. And one of the more striking things is higher numbers of species per unit area um, happening. And these responses can happen actually relatively quickly. There have been a number of different kinds of studies that have looked at the details. Now this doesn't mean that everything gets more abundant. There's actually all kinds of ecology that goes on. And this is really important. We tend to fish on average at the top of food webs in the sea. And as a consequence, when we remove these predators, it often leads to lower uh, mortality rates on the things they used to eat. If we don't fish them, and so you can, when you actually when you stop fishing, such as off the coast here, where we have fisheries for California sheephead and California lobster, that are both really important predators of purple sea urchins. When you s when you stop fishing in these particular areas, the increase in these predators can actually lead to declines in the abundance of urchins, and you can get these cascading effects that happen in some marine reserves where predator abundance goes up as you stop fishing. The things that they eat now decline, and the things that they eat go up. So there are all kinds of ecological rearrangements. But even taking into account the fact that some species are going down and other ones are going up, the averages that you saw in that previous slide suggest that there's dramatic increases that happen on average when you stop fishing in these particular places. So this is all well and good. Very large effects, uh, consistent results. We know a lot about the details of timing and what causes some of this variability. Uh, but I would argue that despite these big effects inside reserves, it's actually still a relatively trivial effect when we're thinking about the species that are being affected. And this is all an issue related to scale. So for example, the Channel Islands right out here, many of you were, may have been around when uh, a process was started by the National Marine Sanctuary Program and the of California to establish a network of marine reserves that ended up uh, closing 26% of the area around the islands in, a, in, a, in the world's real first network of marine reserves. Um, so it was, and it got a lot of international attention. It was obviously very contentious in terms of closing such a large fraction, substantially higher than what we see around the rest of the world. But of course, that 25% is of a management area. It's 25% of the uh, area that the sanctuary uh, manages. But that's not really the relevant scale. The relevant scale from the standpoint of virtually any species it's supposed to impact is actually bigger than this. Because if you take the average uh, length of coastline that a species occurs in across the coast of California, it's about a third bigger than the coastline you can see in this satellite image. 
And those 25% marine reserves that are down there in Channel Islands, so those little teeny green dots that are down in the corner, across an average species range for this area, it still represents something on the order of 1%. So in terms of impact, it's small. And, and in terms of the perspective of these species, uh, if we're going to actually have some benefit to them collectively, uh, we have to think about how we scale up. So there are a number of ways you could scale up. Two, two that I want to talk about. One's very obvious. You make big ones. Um, this is the world's biggest marine protected area. It will become a complete no-take marine reserve in a couple of years. It's the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. And I can never remember the, um, how to pronounce the, the, the Hawaiian name for it. It's a wonderful name. But to give you a sense of how big this is, the black area that's superimposed on the continent of the United States shows you the area that's being protected here. Um, it's larger than the entire nation of New Zealand. It's bigger than the entire Great Barrier Reef National Marine Park. It's huge. And um, so that's one way you can scale up. It clearly is big enough to have impact on certain classes of species in terms of their distribution. But it's unlikely that we're ever going to see very many MPAs of this size, particularly on coastal areas where there's a lot of people. Because, I mean, when you put this along, along the West Coast, you effectively would shut down the entire West Coast of the continent of the US to reach something of comparable size. So this form of scaling, I think, is going to be rare in terms of its uh, opportunity where these are going to emerge, because they effectively uh, rule out the role of I mean, people playing a part in these ecosystems. So an, an argument that many people have been making, and we've been doing it a lot, is that a much more palatable solution uh, may be to design uh, scale this up by designing larger networks where we take a collection of lots of MPAs where there are areas in between that still allow human use and use this in a way that uh, we can try to create a network that has more impact than the sum of the parts of the individual uh, MPAs. Now, networks are an interesting a word. It's like a lot of scientific problems here where uh, the general public has many different definitions they use for a word. And scientists have their own definition for what this word means. And so I think we all need to be on the same page of what we're talking about when we mean a network. Now, fortunately, I think there's actually some really interesting parallels between an ecological network of protected areas and social networks and computer networks. Because they're effectively areas where you've got a bunch of things, people or computers, that can be connected in different ways. And the way the system works depends upon how you connect them. So that, here's an example. You know, you can you could ask uh, in your social network, what's the likelihood that this the, the woman in the lower left has an interesting idea and it somehow gets into Kevin Bacon's head up in the top right? Um, <coughs> and of course, the answer depends upon who knows whom and how the social network is connected. And in these two situations, the answer would be very different in terms of how that information would move. Okay. Well, I think this, the exact same thing is what we're talking about when we're talking about ecological networks of protected areas. You've got areas that are protected. They're separated from one another. But the nature of how we design, where we put them, how big they are, how far apart, things along those lines, uh, if it affects the way that they operate, then the function of the system really depends upon the design of the network and how it's connected. And, and Unlike most problems we have to deal with in terms of these big conservation issues, this one is actually simpler, I think, than human social networks and a variety of other kinds of complicated problems because the, m the means by which different MPAs are connected happens all through the movement of the species involved. And so we've got movement of adults and we've got movement of offspring. And those patterns of connections then are the key things in terms of thinking about how the system might work. Now, this is not nothing new about this. Um, terrestrial uh, reserve design has focused on these kinds of connections for a long time. And it's really been the basis of thinking about conservation corridors between protected areas. So you have a set of protected areas with areas in between where the species are at higher risk. And the idea is to find pathways where the movement of individuals could have some safe path to go from one protected area to the next to increase their likelihood of success. But how do we build a corridor in the sea? I mean, you can do it on land in the sense where you can think of ways that individuals might move and make a pathway and create this 
another area that's got some other forms of lower levels of protection. But it's a much more challenging problem to think about that in a turbulent ocean where things are going in all different directions and there's nobody's following any of these predictable pathways in any necessary way. Well, fortunately, uh, this turns out to be a real advantage. And so let me talk about, um, in a very cartoon way, uh, how these patterns of movement might affect network design. And they really come down to two things. There are going to be some age classes, and these are adults in, uh, in generally, that when they leave the protected area, they're at higher risk. This is exactly the issue of why corridors are put in place on land. And as a consequence, the more things move, the bigger an MPA needs to be. And in fact, you can show formally uh, give for different patterns of movement of individuals exactly how big you need to make an MPA to be able to sustain a, uh, a viable population over the long period of time. So you could have a bunch of species, they all move different amounts, and you put in some MPA of some given size, and you're going to have some species where most individuals spend all of their life living within that particular MPA, and other ones are continually crossing those boundaries. And there are very formal ways this actually has comes out of reserve design on land that uh, the size to be effective in terms of making these populations be sustainable within these different protected areas simply needs to be greater than movement. And you can scale it in a very formal way about how big that is. So it's a very simple rule until you try to apply it to the diversity we see within real world ecosystems because the scales that adults move varies enormously from one species to the next. So uh, these are a group of species along the coast of California, just as examples. And you, I imagine you could find examples for any place you work on the entire planet, this exact same scale of variability within any marine ecosystem, from some where the adults don't move much at all to others where they're uh, regularly moving thousands of kilometers. So this creates a real challenge in terms of operationally putting in place any particular rule. Because if you choose a size of an MPA of something, say, in the tens or the hundred kilometer range, you're going to have some species that are likely to benefit and other ones that are not. Right? And it's fairly predictable in terms of who the winners and losers are going to be. Um, so that's adults. It's, it's really simple there. It's nothing new compared to uh, the Trestle Reserve design. And all there's a lot of formal mathematics to figure out how big those things should be. It's a relatively simple problem other than dealing with diversity. Uh, the, re the thing that's very different, though, about the ocean is that most marine species produce young. They are microscopic. They are released into the plankton. And they drift or swim around for anywhere from a few hours to a few months until they get moved. And in this case, they get moved at a stage where they're not typically at risk for the same kinds of processes that are affecting adults. So fishing practices in a variety of different forms are not something that actually affects the movement of these young. So that as long as uh, these larvae, these young, can get from one protected area to another, it's no different than if they stayed and spent their entire life within a protected area. And you don't need a protected corridor to get to these to between them. All you need is a mechanism for the uh, larvae to be able to, to regularly get there. And so this really comes down to issues of how far apart they are relative to the patterns of ocean currents. And uh, again, this is a, if you get into the details of this, it gets quite complicated. But in a very simple way, it comes down to that the spacing can't be substantially farther than the larvae move. Otherwise, these areas aren't connected. And most of the larvae that are going to leave are going to end up having to grow up as adults in unprotected areas where they're now at risk. So for there to be added benefit, you need to get a sufficient number of young landing in other protected areas. The other uh, part of the good news on this is that these in the sea, because they're drifting in a fluid medium that is uh, dense, um, marine propagules of marine organisms tend to move much further than propagules on land. So these are looking at species where the adults don't move very much and just looking at where the scale of movement is, is uh, done just by the young. And, and what you can see very clearly is this every step here is a factor of 10, that the kind of modal scales of movement of young in the ocean is three orders of magnitude larger than it is on land. 
And this creates some real opportunities because if you were going to depend upon this kind of dispersal on land to get you from one protected area to the next, they have to be really close together. Whereas in the sea, you've got the potential in many of these cases where species can go tens or even hundreds of kilometers um, as relatively uh, protected young from the kinds of risks that we're talking about here and go for very long distances. Okay. So lots, lots of opportunities then for a network to be connected where you don't have to have corridors, you might have to understand the path rate of movement, you have to understand how far things are apart. Um, you know, but again, it's kind of a, some simple opportunities for network design that don't exist in terms of terrestrial resources. The bad news though is just like in the situation with adults, the scale that, that these young move for the larvae also varies by many orders of magnitude. So And in reality, it, you, know, you know, if, if, you, if I put up there that an average dispersal is 40 kilometers, it doesn't mean that all the young go 40 kilometers or that all the young from one year to the next go 40 kilometers. It's incredibly complicated. We have very turbulent flows, all kinds of interesting uh, variability from year to year. Uh, but, and, and, and we've got a pretty good handle in some places about how this, uh, these details of oceanography might uh, complicate but, but still only modify the kinds of rules that I've been talking about so far. And that's something we can use very effectively. But the, still the bottom line is that the, the enough young have to go from one MTA to another MTA to where you can have self-sustaining populations for the network to provide benefits that go beyond just the sum of the effects of those individuals. So in reality what we've come up from over in just about a decade is that Putting these two simple aspects of movement together gives you a lot about characteristics of design that um, can be tailored to a particular place if you have the sophisticated patterns of uh, models to look at patterns of movement. But they really come down to size being driven by scales of adult movement. And if the MTAs are not big enough, then it's predictable that those species are likely to get small benefits. And spacing uh, being driven by scales of movement of those parts of the life cycle that are not at risk when they leave the boundary of the MTA. And if you play with the combinations of these two things, making them bigger and closer together or further apart, you can change the, uh, the, the components of the ecosystem that are likely to benefit from any particular network design. And you can do this much more formally if in fact you can do some elaborate biological models, bioeconomic models that we're, like we have for uh, this coastline but the general guidelines that uh, emerge out of this really come down to just linking these two things with scales of movement, short distance dispersers, either as adults or juveniles being driven, driving size, spacing being driven by movement type. And in the process that has been going on for the last decade here in California, where California passed a law called the Marine Life Protection Act to set up a, a network of, statewide network of marine reserves and marine protected areas, uh, these were the, s the, s the uh, size and spacing guidelines that emerged um, as general guidelines for stakeholders to design networks. Preferred sizes of MTAs being 20 kilometers um, and no further than 50 kilometers apart. And what emerged out of this is, and it's still emerging, is a uh, statewide network that was designed by these rules. Of course, just because scientists suggest guidelines doesn't mean that public policy processes actually lead to MTAs that meet those guidelines. 
but it's not too far off. And um, there, as we've moved along, there's been some really uh, nice work that's done to, to look at the likely consequences that are going to come out of this, this network. So by the time it's done, there'll be over 100 new marine protected areas designed with this kind of network um, in mind. Well, of course, not everybody likes these ideas. Um, and despite the fact that uh, so there are some, uh, we've made a lot of advances in terms of thinking about how you might design networks to enhance conservation, uh, there's still a lot of uh, opposition to this. And this comes from those users who are being excluded. And so as another thing that's really happened here, and this has been driven by thinking about um, these designs in the context of multiple uses by humans, is a lot of work asking the question of whether or not you can achieve these kinds of conservation benefits from networks without imposing large costs on fisheries, or in some cases, by potentially providing benefits to fisheries. And the reason why this might work is because of exactly the same reason why it was hard to get conservation benefits. When the adults leave an MPA, they become part of a fishery. And if larvae don't make it to another MPA, they can grow up to become part of a fishery. And so the exact same kind of issues that make it challenging to get persistence in the MPAs also potentially lead to the MPAs fueling increases in the fishery itself. Now there's been a lot of work on this. I want to just give you kind of the cartoon argument to show you visually why uh, this is possible and a couple of examples that show that um, there's the potential for these MPAs to actually have big effects on fisheries. So one comes from uh, a collapse of a fishery, the cod fishery in New England, which was one of the world's uh, uh, largest fisheries in terms of profits for a very long time. And it collapsed in the mid-1990s. And as a result of this, the US government put in place a number of these very large closed areas. These are not marine protected areas. They're not meant to be uh, marine reserves for some long period of time. They're fisheries closures to help the cod populations recover. Uh, so far, cod have not recovered. And they have we can talk for a long time about why that might be the case. But these closures closed off fishing on a whole variety of other species as well. And some of those have had some really dramatic changes. One of them is haddock. Haddock is a species that uh, moves around a lot like cod, um, but for a variety of reasons has responded relatively dramatically to this protection. And to show you the impact of these closed areas on the fishery, um, what this map is showing you is how much time fishing boats are spending in different locations. So the blue here is not much time, and on the red end of the scale, spending a lot of time. Each boat is tracked with these vessel monitoring devices. And what you can see is they're fishing all along the edge of the closed areas and not spending a lot of time in between. And the reason is because this, this one is plotting what's the catch rate per unit time. And it's, uh, again, the same color scale. Blue's not very good. Red's a great fishing situation. The average fishing rates are on the order as much as 50 times higher on the edges of these closed areas than they are on the areas in between. And as of 2003, these numbers have actually gone up uh, since this, about three-fourths of the entire haddock fishery is caught within just a couple kilometers of the edge of these closed areas. So this is a fishery now, which is basically almost totally dependent upon spillover of adults from these marine protected areas with very small contributions in the areas outside. Same thing can happen, and I think it, you know, from a modeling standpoint, it should be even more important, the contributions of larval export seeding uh, adults outside. It's much more difficult, though, for us to be able to get empirical evidence that that's really affecting these fisheries. Uh, the, here's one example, though, that shows this. This is a marine reserve in the, in the Bahamas, which is that green rectangular box in the lower left. And there are two stages of larvae. So the yellow, the size of the yellow circle tells you how many very recently released larvae are in the water to go out and sample them. And you can see that there's a lot of them around that marine reserve. And then the blue, the size of that tells you how many later stage, a couple, excuse me, a couple weeks later, how, where they're older, what's the distribution of these later stage ones. And you can see that, so starting off, there's huge production around the reserve. Later, 
these, these young are dispersed over much wider areas. This is about as good as you can get in terms of empirical evidence showing that this export of young is actually uh, getting to other places, but it's um, from the standpoint of a logic and modeling and a lot of other work, this is probably playing a bigger role in many cases than export of adults. So the real question that comes down, and this is work that's really contentious right now, lots of debate, is how this affects yields. I mean, in the case of haddock, clearly the landings of haddock have gone through the roof. They're much higher after this closure, but that's a case where the fishery was probably uh, heavily overfished prior to the close order. Um, there are going to be other cases where it's, it's not likely to be increased. Now, there are very few cases where we have empirical data on this because we don't really have many places around the world where large MPAs have been in place for very long or where networks exist. So this is all the world of models. So here's, here's an analysis of models. If you look at, if we go out and study the models, there have been about 60 models that have looked at whether MPAs should be beneficial to fisheries or not. And, and we can just ask, and this is looking at it purely from the standpoint of ones that measured what's the likely impact on fisheries profits. So this has nothing to do with conservation, fisheries profits. And what, what came out is about, in about half the cases, re situations with marine reserves actually give you higher fisheries profits than situations without, about half of them. Okay. And from this, you know, there, there are a whole variety of reasons why you might expect this variability. I don't want to go through this list, but there are different characteristics of of species, there are different characteristics of how well the thing is managed as to whether you'd expect yields might go up or go down or not be changed at all. Uh, so we're starting to get some sense about, again, about who might win and who might lose. But uh, uh, the, the net result that comes out of this is, one, it's not just a complete loss, that some of the losses are compensated by these spillover effects. And in many cases, and if they're designed well, uh, there may be opportunities for fisheries profits to go up. The other f uh, really intriguing aspect of this too is how big of a closed area does it take to get the maximum profits in those cases where highest profits occurred with, with marine reserves. And so these are, these are all again the optimal amount of area closed to maximize profits. This is not to maximize conservation benefits. This is purely looking at it from the context of the uh, fisheries profits. And you can see the values are large. So they're in the realm of values that are substantially larger than what a lot of calls from conservation groups have been over the last decade for setting aside parts of the ocean, say 20% uh, in different kinds of marine protected areas. Okay, so that's enough on marine protected areas. Now I'm going to go. Um, and talk about the other side, which is thinking about fixing the fishery. And uh, as I said, there are lots of evidence that fisheries have been declining. Um, actually, I'm not even going to go into what that argument was. There's just a bunch. There's a lot of evidence that we've got these fisheries declines. And so there, the other, we talked about using MPAs. And that was originally driven not to try to benefit fisheries, but in fact to try to stop the effects of fisheries from having catastrophic conservation impacts. And now I want to talk about fixing the management problem, where clearly the goal there is, in fact, uh, fishery benefits. And we'll come back to the issue of its conservation impacts. So why do we need to fix the management? What's the evidence? Well, there's plenty of evidence that, we, that uh, places do uh, really stupid things when they manage fisheries. So these are data from management of mackerel uh, in the southeast uh, US for a 15-year period that was in the, I think, 80s and early 90s. And um, so what happens is they had a scientific committee that said for each year, how many, how many mackerel should you catch to have some kind of a sustainable yield here? And so they, they come up with some estimate. Each year I'm just scaling this average to be 100. So this is the upper end of what the scientific recommendation was. And, but they also gave a lower bound because there's a lot of uncertainty. Scientists uh, don't know exactly how many you should catch. And so here's a case where there's relatively large uncertainty. You know, they're, upper and lower bounds for recommendation on what the quota should be in a year is you know, different, differs by over a factor of two. So here's what the average quota was for those 15-year periods that was actually adopted by the Fisheries Management Council at that time. And here's what the catch was. And um, so I think it's pretty clear. I don't have to tell you anything more that there are examples where there are uh, recipes for failure that have dominated a lot of aspects of fisheries 
And a lot of this really comes down to um, issues related to the tragedy of the commons. Now, I know that most of you have probably heard of the tragedy of the commons, uh, but it essentially relates to a wide variety of problems of dealing with um, uh, the problems, the challenge of managing resources that are managed as a commons where everybody um, can have access to them. And I find, and this is, this is a really nice way to illustrate what the tragedy of the commons is all about. So you imagine these two kids, they're given a, a really cold smoothie and uh, two straws and they're just sharing them. What's going to happen? They're going to they're gonna suck like crazy to try to get more of it than the other one gets, right? So, so the natural response of this is that you, you get a brain freeze. And so, you know, if we substitute fish for the uh, smoothie and fishermen for the two kids and collapsed fishery for the brain freeze, you basically have an understanding of what the tragedy of the commons is about is that if there's no security of ownership, they're going to race like crazy to uh, get as much of that resource as they can, and it causes them to do all kinds of stupid things, right? That are stupid in their own self-interest in the long run, but it's driven by these incentives to race with the other thing. Now, economists for a long time have been arguing that, in fact, this way to solve this problem is to put ownership into the, into the uh, ownership of the resource, secure ownership of the resource, okay? And the argument, is that this will promote stewardship and the general idea is that if you, instead of having them share that smoothie, you give them each a share that they are securing, they'll drink it in a very different way. They'll steward this, um, my smoothie and have a very different response. Okay. Well, uh, th this is what we call cat shares. This is kind of the latest term for this uh, broad array of approaches of basically giving some security of ownership of a part of the research, a resource to the fishermen, and um, the argument is that if there's security, then you would expect that there's a variety of different incentives that, that switch this from being a short-term race to giving them a long-term incentive to um, steward the resource. Now, there are a variety of ways you can do cat shares. Uh, you can do it the most common way that's happened in the U.S. and around the industrialized world is by something called an individual transferable quota, which is you just take the total quota and each individual fisherman has some fractional share of that. So you might own 2%, and whatever the quota is set in that particular year, you get to catch 2% of those fish. You have security of getting to catch that 2%. You don't have to race with anybody else. You can time it in terms of safety, prices, a whole variety of things that can increase profits. And um, other ways to do it, though, is you could do, you could do this by uh, spatial allocation. So instead of you could get shares of particular locations, there's a variety of other ways, cooperatives and things that where you can effectively uh, uh, put in the same kind of incentive through some form of, of ownership. Now, the, uh, the, there's clear evidence from studies over the last 10 years that this can lead to higher profits. What was uncertain is whether this you get this, the ownership actually leads to better stewardship and whether you get better results in terms of the number of fish um, over the long term by switching to these kinds of management systems. So this is another case like the Marine Reserve one where the experiment's been tried many, many times. In this case, again, over 100 times. This might Marine Reserves. But no one had actually pulled together and synthesized the data to ask whether or not they really worked. So this is work that Chris and uh, John Lineham and I did a, a couple of uh, years ago, I guess now, a year and a half, to actually look at what's been the performance of these fisheries where you put ownership into the fishery. And so here's, here's kind of the, here are the data for the percentage collapse starting in the 1950s going up to the early 2000s for fisheries that over this period of time never converted to cat shares. And that's 99% of the fisheries. Okay, so still a small fraction. And you can see that by the end we're down to, oh, uh, something on the order of, um, well, it's that plastic over there, close to 30% collapse by the early 2000s. Now during this time, um, in response to uh, collapses, there are a variety of uh, starting implementing of these catch share fisheries in the late 70s and then ramping up pretty dramatically in the 80s and 90s. And so here's the performance of the catch share fishery. And it's a little bit complicated, but let me walk you through this. So before this point, um, all of these fisheries are not managed with catch shares. 
And you can see that the two groups, even though it's a small group, a lot more fluctuations because there's only 100 fisheries, the cat share fisheries are, still, are declining and collapsing at roughly the same rates as the other ones are. It's only after you go into this phase where they start, some of them start transitioning into catch shares, catch shares that they start going in a very different trajectory. Even though, and this, even though this group and still includes a lot of fisheries to be part of this that have not uh, been converted yet. And so we, have, you know, we did it as more of a, as a thought experiment, and this may be hard to see that green line, of imagining when this idea really started getting put forward in the 70s with all fisheries that switched over to this kind of a cat ship system. And it had performed with a similar uh, pattern given the year-to-year -year variation and species characteristics and things like that. Um, you can see the pro projection is it would have had a very different trajectory to the, the rate of collapse of these fisheries. So that has led to, uh, I mean, that, 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 that those results got a lot of res um, positive response in the press. They've uh, influenced the U.S. national policy in a really interesting way uh, with the opportunity that was presented by uh, Joan Lubchenco becoming head of no NOAA. Um, who just happened to be my PhD advisor. And, um, <coughs> and so now there was just recently released a new U.S. national policy that all fisheries in the U.S. have to at least consider management by catch shares as part of their goals. So it's not that they're forcing this as an option, but the, and that's a striking contrast to just a decade ago when, in fact, the Magnuson-Stevens Act at that time actually banned this form of management of fisheries. So there are lots of issues in terms of details of design. There are a lot of things that other aspects of community goals and social goals that really need to be taken into account. Um, but uh, there, I think there's pretty compelling evidence that just like in the MPA case, that there's uh, broad um, benefits that can occur from utilizing this form of management as part of, the, as one of the tools. Um, and that if it's designed well, that may be an important aspect of fixing some of these problems. So I want to end. Oops, I'm on it. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to end by by giving some little teasers about um, where where we're going and where a number of students that have been working in this this group project uh, have been thinking about a whole bunch of interesting problems that start becoming. Um, potentially solvable in new and interesting ways, if instead of viewing these as two different approaches, is if we start linking them together. And it becomes interesting because in the MPAs were driven by a conservation goal. They were not really driven in the beginning to fix fisheries. And yet, there are ways that they can be done to at least reduce the cost of fisheries and in some cases that benefit. The same thing with the catchers. I think the catchers were really driven primarily by fixing fisheries as a profitable business. But it's clear that a big part of that comes from, in fact, achieving conservation benefits in terms of producing more fish. And that's why uh, it actually has, in both of these cases, you're getting a combination of, of resource benefits as well as conservation benefits. And the opportunity then of, of putting them together, I think, creates some really interesting things. So let me throw just a few. Uh, again, you know, m most of the cat shares that have been put in place are these kinds of individual quotas. That's what all the data I showed you are, but, and it's sort of like cap and trade for fish. Um, but the, the really interesting one that we've been doing a lot of thinking about and uh, some students have been doing some real interesting work on is this spatial, which has the potential of really linking in, I think, with MPAs in really interesting ways. So instead of allocating a fraction of the catch, you act allocate a particular section of coast to a individual or group of owners. Now I can show you very in a cartoon way again why this might why there might be a synergy between MPAs and TERFs. So imagine you've divided up the world into these uh, TERFs, and so you own this one on the right, and somebody else owns the one on the left. Um, and so you're fi you're both fishing in beautifully protected shares, and you're getting lots of higher yields than you did before, and so on and so forth. But you, as the owner of this turf, have a, if somebody were to come to your neighbor and offer to buy out their turf, say the Nature Conservancy wanted to come in and buy their turf and not fish it, 
um, you would have a huge incentive to say Yahoo. I mean, do it because what's going to happen is those spillover benefits now become yours. Um, the, so that when you start getting this kind of spatial ownership of management, it starts creating some potential private incentives for owners, whether it's a cooperative or an individual, of turfs to become huge advocates for MTAs nearby. Okay? And this could change things in pretty dramatic ways from the nature of so on and so forth. I don't want to go into this too much, but this is, I think, the, you know, the really exciting stuff is some work that Chris and Dan Caffeine have done in terms of looking at how these uh, models that start incorporating the details of oceanography and imagine a coastline where you've parceled it up into a bunch of these turfs. You've got spatial management groups managing their own areas. And, and, um, and then you ask, what, what's the consequence of the profits? This is purely looking at it in terms of fisheries. If somebody were to come in and buy up one of those turfs and turn it into a marine reserve. And, and the reason why I have this going on down here is because this is now taking into account the complexities of the details of those larval dispersal uh, uh, patterns. And, and what they found uh, is a really interesting result. What's, what, what here is those, all those little spots that were potential, that were turfs, uh, you can flip each one of them individually and into a no-take zone and then ask, how does that affect total profits? And what you see is that in virtually every case, if you convert an MTA, a single MTA, and I mean a single turf into an MTA, the total profits go up. And in some cases it goes up dramatically, 35% for the collective profits. And this is all tied to the fact that some places are great sources of young and that collectively across this entire group of turf owners, there are places that there should be strong advocates for in terms of protecting these sources of young that are providing the stock you're going to harvest in your turf at a later time. And even more interesting is if you not, don't just do this as one, but you ask, what's the optimal array of MTAs from the standpoint of purely profits? Nothing to do with the conservation side. This is what came, came out of their analysis. Um, and I don't remember, it was what, 28% or something like that of the area closed in no-take marine reserves gives the fishermen, the turf owners, the highest profit. So another way that there's, there's synergistic. Back to this cartoon. Okay, another, that we talked about how this kind of dividing up the resource might work in terms of catch shares, but you know, imagine that instead of these being individual fishermen, they're now countries. And this is another one of these kind of problems where you have a shared resource that even if it's managed well internally on the two sides, creates all kinds of interesting problems. And this is when fish that move cross international boundaries. Uh, because the reason why this system could work is because you could have some authority that could say, you get that fraction of the catch, and you get that fraction of the catch. And when you do it uh, across these international boundaries, uh, this becomes much more complicated in terms of who enforces this. Everybody uh, starts to distrust whether the other country is going to follow the rules. And um, so um, you end up getting a situation where even if you have catchers within the two countries, you could actually still get this interesting race of uh, boundary. And, and generically, these kinds of transboundary fisheries can be disasters. The one we've been starting to work on is the Anchoveta fishery, which is the world's largest fishery. It occurs uh, on the, along the coast of South America in the Humboldt Current on the uh, countries of Peru and Chile. Just to show you how big this fishery is, this is the global catch of fish divided up into different categories. The top is things that nobody accounts for. Second one is discards, things that have caught that you didn't really want to catch and they were thrown back or killed or whatever. And then coming to the bottom, you've got all the species of fish that are pelagic and swim around in the sea, all the bottom fish that are kind of round fish, and all the invertebrates that are caught. And then you've got Peruvian anchoveta, one species, which is about 15% of the total biomass taken out of the sea in that one species. So it's a huge fishery. Um, and it's uh, really interesting because it has three stocks. One's in Peru, one's in Chile, and one's right on the border. And the one in Peru and the one that's all in Chile are both managed reasonably well. 
the one with the marriage on the border is a complete disaster. And so you have the exact same fisheries management agencies working, and yet the one that crosses the boundary, and in fact, while we're there, we, we keep hearing that from us. Well, we can't implement the safe rules because we, because if we don't catch the fish, the Chileans will, or vice versa, talking to them. And so, so here's a situation where the, you know, the allocation of quotas and stuff creates, there's still all these problems because of the fact that the fish can move and the inability to enforce kind of the, uh, the, the catcher system in a way that actually creates the right incentives. But the question is whether you can solve this problem by putting an MPA on the boundary that effectively forces the catch rates of the two countries to go down. This, even, if, even, if, you know, even if they want to catch as many as they can, if you make the MPA big enough, you can protect enough of the fish to where you limit their stock. So this is, this is the hypothesis. And uh, Rebecca Tosland's been doing some, I'm not going to tell you the answer right away, but it, the answer is three letters, not two. Um, uh, and so I'm going to let her tell you about that sometime in the future, about how exciting this kind of result uh, is potentially going to be because of these disasters of um, transboundary fisheries. Finally, one more catcher problem. Um, so here's the way we normally think about catchers, but there are also problems with poachers. Now, I'm not talking about poachers that are uh, people that, I mean, poachers people are a problem too in terms of catcher fisheries. Uh, but I'm talking about the fact that there are natural you know, species in these ecosystems that also eat the same species. And this is a really big deal with the Antivetta because uh, if, you're, if it's 15% of the global catch, you can imagine we're taking out an enormous amount of biomass out of our ecosystem. And some of that that we're taking out used to be eaten by other things. And, and these are the three of the examples of other things. There's a whole variety of other species. Um, in most, most food webs, we tend to disproportionately fish at the top. And we've been moving down, fishing on predators. Uh, this is one where it's fishing relatively low. And, it, and in many ways, there are, uh, people have argued that this has real benefits of fishing lower in the food web because you you actually, for a given area and the productivity that's there, you can actually harvest more food for human consumption. Uh, but in this case, that harvesting comes at the expense of all the things you used to harvest it. And so one of the really interesting questions here is how do we deal with these higher trophic levels that were also predators? And can we adopt the same kind of combination of catcher approaches by effectively thinking about allocating shares to the predators and the and, and this needs so, and, and so um, this is exactly what we're doing. And there's, uh, there's a, a number of us that have been working with the governments in Peru to think about uh, how, how many more anchoveta would you have to leave in the water, for example, to get a particular number of, a particular response by the penguins. Or so in this case, the penguins have dropped by about 90% of abundance um, over the last few decades because of the removal of the primary food source. And this is the, you know, the, the preliminary answers suggest that there are ways, in fact, just as in the other stories I've talked about, uh, for actually leaving a lot more anchoveta in the sea and getting, as comparable, getting comparable profits for the Peruvian fisheries. And if that's the case, by combining these kinds of MPA and catcher effects, then it provides a way for us to actually have, once again, uh, by looking at both the fishery and the fish at the same time, as well as the fishermen, by looking at win-win solutions, or at least win not too big of a loss uh, solutions uh, for these different ecosystems. So um, I've gone over a little bit, um, but let me uh, stop there. I think the main point that you know that comes out of this is that this that thinking about these kinds of approaches by, by from a, the objectives of a whole variety of different users, both the natural users and the unnatural ones, or we humans as part of these ecosystems, can really change the way we can, uh, we can manage these ecosystems in ways that are, uh, have the potential for enhancing the productivity of the fisheries and profitability of the fisheries, as well as providing uh, benefits to the species that are being fished. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.
Well, it's a good question. So I can, well, I can go back to the slide probably. Um, it's the point is that if you look at before cat share started, uh, in this period for the 30, 20 years or so before they started, the, the fraction of the cat share, the, the fisheries that eventually become cat shares, was a little bit less collapsed than the ones that um, were not. And in fact, statistically, it turns out there is a small um, difference between those two groups. A big part of this, though, um, is just that you're dealing with 11,000 fisheries here and 100 there. So it's a, you know, there's an aspect of this which is just a, s a sampling problem, which is where that thought experiment kind of gets around some of that where you look at uh, just what the performance of the two would be if you factor out what, the, what this uh, effect or the benefit might have been uh, prior to their establishment. And there, you, know, you can envision that there could be things like that. There, there could be some characteristics of fisheries that uh, were more likely to have switched over to cat share fisheries. There could be economic things, there could be life history things that would be associated with that little bit of a, of a difference. But it's, it's, it's still quite small compared to the what happens after you switch to cat share. So the statistical analysis pulls that out and the benefits of cat shares that were in that thought experiment are, have totally discarded that. So it's looking at only the added benefit of putting in cat shares regardless of whether there, there are small sample groups that we looked at had some benefit. Oh, right here. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, it is a problem of an overcapitalized fishing industry. There are three big boats and they're moving to high technology to take the weight for fish. Is that not something that's happened in the intervening years? So that you know, the answer to that of course varies a lot from one fishery to the next, but this is this is one of the consequences you get of the race to fish is that if you're racing with the other individuals to catch those the, that total quota as fast as you can. There's a overinvestment in faster boats, and you have to go out on the first day of the season, even if it's the largest storm of the year, and a whole variety of different kinds of things that uh, can reduce your profits um, and not, in the long run, really lead to any increases in the amount of fish that you're catching. And so this is really what drives a lot of the economic disaster in some of these fisheries. Um, this is one of the issues about design of catch shares that really matters, because one of the one of the complaints that some groups have about the, the conversion to cat shares is that you can get a consolidation of the fishery into a small number of owners. And some of that consolidation um, makes perfect sense as a, a, from an efficiency standpoint. Other parts of it uh, can be just for a whole variety of other reasons that some individuals who are much better fishermen buy up can, can be can get more profits on a given fractional quota, and so they're willing to pay a higher price, and so you can get consolidation in the hands of, of the best fishermen like that. And so that can have consequences in terms of consolidating the fishery. It can also lead to situations where uh, groups from outside might come in and buy quota sh shares, and so a local fishery can actually disappear. There's a whole variety of consequences at the community and social level that have happened if, in fact, you don't think about these up front. Now, there are ways you can deal with all of those by uh, addressing the issues of uh, allocation of shares, who can own shares, uh, caps on how much an individual can own. And there's a variety of ways, if those are really important goals for a particular area that's being managed, that you can address those kinds of, of issues. But to some extent, you want consolidation to happen. I mean, most of these fisheries are so overcapitalized with so many boats that uh, that's, that's actually part of the goal here is to reduce uh, that to where the profitability can go up even if you're catching fewer fish. The, your the comment about the predators at the end or the, the, the poachers raised the question I was wondering about. You mentioned that it's dangerous for adults to leave but less for the larva. But I understand if you're talking about critters other than that pesky homo sapiens, it goes the other way that there's a very high level of predation on the, the larval and baby stages. And would that actually get worse if your marine protected areas mean that there are more critters out there eating the ones that you hope they don't eat? So, so that's, that's, a, that's a good question. And um, from the standpoint of what I was talking about in terms of the risk, it's really relative to 
the activity that's being changed by the regulation. So that's the fishery that's outside. So you're not, the fact that you can fish outside the area doesn't really put the larvae at risk except indirectly in terms of its exposure to things that might eat it. But, you know, if anything, the highest abundances are inside the marine protected areas, not outside. And so the, the, the consequence that what you're talking about really has is it tends to, if anything, reduce the number of larvae that successfully settle into the, into the MPAs once they get into those MPAs, because that's where all the mouths are. And there are far fewer mouths, much lower densities in the areas outside. So, uh, that, but the net effect is really, um, in terms of on the fishery, is comes out of looking at this as a, as a whole population model where you're taking into account those kinds of effects of density. And they're just more than compensated by the fact that if you've got 500% increase in biomass in an MPA, and on average, the production of young tends to go up much faster than biomass, that, that added increase in the number of young into the system more than compensates for the uh, amounts that are consumed. And so that's why you end up getting these net potential net benefits outside. Well, yeah, that's what I was going to say to you, but I'm thinking in terms of the distance between MPAs for your network, wouldn't there also be more predator mouths on you know, somewhere around that next MPA, meaning that you might actually have to have them closer together to get the net benefit? Yeah, and I mean, you can, and you can do, the, you know, if you do the, I did the cartoon version of this. If you really want to do the detailed models, and Chris is, you know, the one who's really done spectacular versions of this, uh, to some extent, those kinds of things can be taken into account. So, but, but the net effect is the result, that you actually see these general increases in some cases as in the haddock fishery, you're seeing substantial increases in the actual catch rate that's associated with the MPA catch. Sure. Time for beer.